So speaking about senescence, so you're studying senescence, but at a cancer research place. Uh, can you talk about, so are senescent cells similar to cancer cells? How, what are the similarities and differences between the two? That's a really good question. So um, in terms of the characteristics, firstly, of senescent cells, senescent cells, we often describe them um, as entering a sort of irreversible um, cell cycle arrest. So they stop proliferating, um, which is why you often hear them called as like zombie cells, because they're kind of like not doing anything. But whilst they don't replicate, they're still very metabolically active and they develop their so-called uh, senescence associated secretory phenotype where they secrete a variety of like inflammatory molecules, signaling molecules, um, proteases that remodel the external environment. Um, and so they're very much active zombies, <laughs> I guess. Um, and so that's a senescent cell. What is a cancer cell? So a cancer cell is a cell that has this like uh, proliferative ability because that's what gives rise to tumors. Um, and at the same time, they also can, are also very metabolically active and they do also secrete uh, different things um, into the environment, which um, helps to promote further tumor growth. And so, you, yeah, there definitely are similarities. And one, uh, one way that you can cause a cell to become senescent is by expressing so-called oncogenes. So oncogenes are genes that uh, when they get mutated, they become like aberrantly active or constitutively active um, that causes cells to keep on uh, replicating. Um, and one example is this protein called RAS. And so if you activate RAS in a cell at high levels, it can cause that cell to enter senescence. And then the question is, how does it, does that cell escape senescence and become tumorous? Or does that senescent cell through its inflammatory environment, if it's like not cleared, cause other cells to get damaged and to become uh, cancerous? So, I mean, yeah, there's a lot of, there are some similarities and there's also, there's presence of senescent cells in tumors. Um, I think one potential way of seeing it is like senescent cells are like a potential stepping stone or like gateway to, to cancer, but I don't think that that's necessarily clear at the moment. Um, yeah, so the way you can view senescence is a kind of tumor suppressive mechanism because initially it's there to stop a cell replicating if it's damaged from causing cancer, but the presence of a senescent cell might also help to drive tumor genesis, if that makes any sense. Yes, yes, because I have heard that, that I guess the presence of senescent cells kind of drives neighboring cells to be more cancerous, potentially. Yeah. 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 So, but both of them can, both of them um, resist being killed or dying. Do they use similar pathways for that? Um, so that's, a, again, an interesting question because um, you've probably heard about so-called senolytics, which are drugs that um, are hoping to selectively kill senescent cells. And so um, senescent cells seem to upregulate anti-apoptotic pathways. So apoptosis is a form of cell death. And so what these analytics I think are aiming to do is kind of affect the signaling within a senescent cell such that it can um, overcome this, this barrier and cause cell death of a senescent cell. Some of those current analytics are kind of like repurposed cancer drugs. And so I guess to some extent, it would therefore suggest that you could try and target them in a similar way. But at the same time, it seems that the senolytics are still, I mean, senescent cells are different to cancer cells. So their signaling pathways are different. And so there probably would be overlapping, but also different ways of them preventing cell death. Um, I don't, basically my, my answer is I don't, I'm not entirely sure, but that's an interesting question. Sticking with senolytics for a second, what do you think is the most kind of promising of the, the ones that are kind of available? Sure. Um, so our lab doesn't like, um, directly study senolytics, actually we're more interested in like um, senescent surveillance, so how the immune system can recognize senescent cells to clear them. It's like, like an endogenous system we already have. Um, but in terms of senolytics, I mean, I can only base my opinion on what I've read. Um, and obviously I know James Kirkland's done a lot of interesting work on the combination of both desatinib and quercetin. 
and now more recently fisetin and even more recently there's the grapeseed extract uh, procyanide in C1 um, which seems to show selective ability to kill senescent cells. I guess my one um, biochemical chemist perspective is that these like flavonoids that they've identified in these studies are probably do more than just implement senescent cells they probably also we don't really know what it's exactly how they're acting within a cell what they're binding to or how they're manipulating the signaling pathways and so whilst they might kill senescent cells they might also influence other cells I mean those other influences could be beneficial but I, I don't know for certain at the moment um, so there's like other senolytic approaches which um, you, they're not like small molecules, they're kind of uh, alternative strategies to clear senescent cells. Um, and so one of them involves using like antibody drug conjugates. So senescent cells have like certain me- um, proteins they express on their membrane that are higher in senes- senescent cells than like other cells. And so you can get an antibody that would recognize the membrane proteins on senescent cells and infuse to that a kind of like cytotoxic drug that when it gets like taken into the, the senescent cell, it kills the cell that way. And so I think that would be one way to improve specificity of senolytics. But then, yeah, the other question is, are senolytics even going to be beneficial? I mean, obviously, there's, there are mouse studies that s- seem to suggest yes. <clears throat> but I think the questions are more, uh, is there a certain subset of senescent cells that are going to be better to, cl- to clear than others? Um, when should they be given and how could they cooperate with other therapeutic strategies? Yeah, so senescent cells have function, right? And a number of the functions that I saw were related to, uh, I think, pregnancy or in the placenta and things like that. And they are also used for um, wound healing, right? Mm-hmm. And, and I noticed that, you know, if I take Questin, uh, then my wounds seem to take longer to heal, right? I don't know. But for, for an older person, what fun- are there any other functions that sen- senescent cells perform? Yes, I mean that's an interesting question. And so <clears throat> we, yeah, so we've spoken about the I guess like the detrimental sides to senescent cells of these inflammatory factors. <clears throat> but in terms of like the more positive aspects, the first one, which I guess I've already touched on, is like the tumor suppressive mechanism that the cell becomes senescent because it's probably damaged or mutated. And you don't want it proliferating. So in that case, you might think, okay, clearing it's fine. Um, but by clearing it, you also remove um, the, the SAS, the signaling molecules that it secretes. And understanding the function of that secretory phenotype and how it's involved in wound healing or repair. And that might give us some indication as to how can we know the timing of when to remove senescent cells. And so there's an interesting study um, that showed that interleukin-6 um, which is one of these inflammatory factors that are secreted by senescent cells, is actually really important for aiding cellular reprogramming. So this is kind of a bit of a segue, but um, cellular reprogramming is basically taking a specialized cell and turning it back to like a stem cell. And so you can use like the Yamanaka factors to, to do this. And there's been a couple of studies now that showed that the reprogramming using Yamanaka factors is more efficient in the presence of senescent cells when you've got things like interleukin-6 being secreted. And so you could think about it in like a in vivo perspective with wound healing. One of the beneficial aspects of having senescent cells is they can maybe add state stem cells or aid reprogramming so that you've got stem cells active, able to replicate and basically replace the damage that's been caused. So yeah, I think that's, one of my hesitations with the clearance of senescent cells, despite the fact that there does seem to be uh, currently like promising data coming from them. So I think the, the solution is we need to better understand the function of the different components of the secretory phenotype. And then on from that, maybe we can use things uh, such as semimorphics, which are drugs that are supposed to blunt the the aspects of the secretory phenotype without actually clearing the senescent cells. And so, yeah, I mean, I didn't think we, we still didn't really understand senescent cells is my, my, my long, my simple answer. But, but I definitely think maybe in specific cases such as osteoarthritis, where there's maybe more acute induction of senescent cells, that's, you know, the inflammation is causing the pain where it might be more beneficial than just naturally 
healthy, otherwise healthy individuals? We, you, we talked a little bit before about markers of senescence. Now, we need to be able to identify a senescent, well, we need the drug to be able to identify that it's a senescent cell so it can go in and affect it. Are we getting any closer to those markers? And, and you talked about that kind of antibody connected to a, to a, a toxin. So, but that must still search for something on the outside of the cell, correct? So uh, does that, what does that search for? And are we getting any closer to having like a, a complete marker for senescent cells? Yeah, so the study that I mentioned about these antibody drug conjugates, I believe they targeted a membrane protein called B2M. So I know the first author of that paper and she told me that it wasn't like the best marker for senescent cells. Yeah, definitely the search is not over. I guess the idea is you wanna find something that's more highly expressed in a senescent cell than normal cells. And then you could potentially like uh, reduce the dose or like alter the dose of the antibodies such that it's more likely to bind to a senescent cell than to an otherwise healthy cell. Um, so there is potential, but then in terms of the molecular aspect of studying senescence, if I was to publish a paper and say, okay, this is a senescent cell, I would have to prove that it was senescent by using multiple biomarkers because there just there doesn't seem to be like one really good measurement for a senescent cell. Yeah. And then I, I think the other interesting thing is like, there are different ways that a cell can become senescent. I've, one is like DNA damage. One is by having these oncogenes. One is replicative senescence when the telomeres get too short. And there hasn't been much work still yet that directly compares these different types of senescent cells. And then there's also the tissue specificity to take into account. A senescent cell in the lung might be very different to a senescent cell in the liver. I think there's, yeah, there's a lot of heterogeneity within the senescent state. And that's why it's so hard to find like a unique marker that identifies all senescent cells. But that doesn't necessarily have to be a bad thing. We could exploit that, those differences. to maybe target specific subsets of senescent cells. And that's going back to the further question of maybe it's only a subset of senescent cells we want to clear. And actually it might work out for the best. But yeah, I don't think we have those answers yet.